Hey everyone, and welcome to the time-lapse video of my painting process for my new painting, uh, Found. My name is Matt Huntley, and you can find my work at MatthewJHuntley.com, on Instagram, at MattHuntleyArtist, and also on Patreon, Patreon.com slash MatthewHuntley. Alright, so uh, I neglected to record the first part of my process for this, so let me just talk you through what I've done to get started. Um... So before I start painting, I uh, do a lot of digital studies, and once I've settled on a composition that I like, I usually build a model. Uh, in this case, I smashed some plaster up and did some cardboard work to create like a little model city that was destroyed, uh, and I'll shoot reference with models. At that point, I'm ready to start painting, so in this case, um, I created a digital mock-up of my reference photo and my models and stuff, and then uh, I transfer that. Uh, by a hand using a grid method to the canvas. So I'll draw a grid on my digital study and then a grid on my canvas and uh, copy it by hand, basically. Um, and I do all that in raw umber. And once that is done, I will uh, start doing the first pass, what I call the first pass. So I go and try to address every area of the painting very loosely and quickly while still trying to capture uh, value and color as best I can. And the purpose for that is that uh, you can't really make decisions in a vacuum, right? So, for example, you know, the skin is supposed to be a certain lightness or darkness relative to the sky. You know, well, you have to have the sky in there in order to see how you need to make the skin look. So the first pass, I kind of do all of that uh, as best I can as I go. But obviously, you know, with nothing being painted at some point I just have to make a decision kind of arbitrarily. So, you know, I just painted the sky as I thought it should be. And once the whole thing's covered, I go back in afterwards and um, do a second pass. But we'll, we'll get to that. So anyway, uh, that's where we're at right now. And let's dive in. All right. So uh, right now you can see where I had already got a little bit of work done. I did her, uh, the giant's hands and the bit of the leg, the background sky, and uh, right now I'm currently working on the building. And uh, you can see pretty much the core of my process right here. Um, you saw a little bit just a few seconds ago that the building kind of had like a, a striped pattern going from dark to light. Um, and I, I don't show any of this in this video. Um, but when I mix paint, you know, I, I spend the first maybe 45 minutes to an hour of my process is just mixing paint on my palette. And... Typically what I'll do is I'll, I'll create a, uh, a gradation from dark to light. So, if, you know, if I'm in this case working on this building, I know I kind of want to have this uh, warmer, warmer brown color. I'll get a really dark brown, slightly brighter brown, even brighter, and then closer to white. You know, I might have four or five piles of paint so that when you look at it creates a, a gradation, a value scale. And then when I go and paint, you know, I'll just block in the dark shapes and the light shapes and then go back with the uh, either a clean brush just to blend what's already there or um, if I put down the darkest darks and the lightest lights I can grab those intermediate pools of paint to kind of blend as well and um, I did the same thing you know for the hands the skin and at the sky but I'm not really bound by these pools of paint either, you know. So if I, again, with that hand, the hand that's uh, supporting the building, you can see that the thumb is a little bit more saturated than the rest of it. You know, so anytime during my process that I realize, oh, I need a specific color just for this one moment, I'll just, you know, stop painting at that moment and go to my palette and, and mix up whatever needs to be mixed uh, and then apply the paint as needed. So uh, it's not like you know, you mix it up and that's the only, only stuff you can use. You know, it's just a, a good way to get started and a quick way to get started. Um, right now I'm painting in the, the rubble in the background. This was a lot of fun because it's actually pretty loose. You know, it looks in the final piece, which I'll, I'll have up at the end of the video. It looks really rendered and realistic, or at least I think it does. Uh, I hope it comes across that way, but, uh, in actuality it's, um, it's fairly loose. It's, uh, you know, just some light brush strokes and some dark, uh, suggested shadows. And then I kind of fuzz them out a little bit to 
give the the feeling of atmospheric perspective. You know, this is a, a really huge battle that's just taking place. So there's smoke and dust in the air, and uh, that atmosphere pushes the space back. Um, and as you can see, I'm going into the foreground right now, the foreground rubble. And I think uh, in relation to the background, this is really important because um, the detail in the, these foreground elements is what makes the background look so realistic. If if you didn't have this super detailed uh, spot in the foreground to look at, uh, let me start over. You know, you look at the, you look at the foreground. And you're like, oh, that's really realistic. These rocks. Okay, I can see how it, you know what's going on. It primes your brain so that when you look at the the stuff in the background, you're like, oh, look, it's more rocks. And uh, you know, you need those moments of detail to inform your viewer for what the rest of the painting is supposed to be. Um, Conversely, if you have nothing but detail uh, and no areas that are a little bit looser or uh, blurrier or, you know, just uh, less rendered, basically, um, it causes the whole image to flatten out, you know. Uh, so you really need to have these variations where you kind of push and pull, okay, where it's more detailed in one area. The focal point is usually a good spot to do that and then a little bit less so in other places. And, and that really, um, it helps to add to the realism overall. And also, you know, just as, as an image, it makes it more satisfying to look at, you know, it's kind of give, gives your eye something to bounce around on. And uh, I, you can see in the, in the video that I, uh, I look to my left a lot. I've got my uh, computer screen right there um, with my digital mock-up. And as well as all the photos I took of, uh, you know, the rubble I made and the uh, the photo shoots with the models and stuff. And, you know, that reference is so important for my process for being able to create uh, imaginary scenes that look realistic. So if you're struggling with, you know, your own art, you're like, man, it's just not looking as real as I want it to be. Use reference. Absolutely use reference. Um, all the pros do it. You know, and that's not to say, you know, there's nothing wrong with working from your imagination, but um, at least for me, you know, unless you're Kim Jung uh, G, I think is how you pronounce his name, this awesome Korean artist, um, you know, you find yourself when you're working from imagination, repeating things, you know, you've got like, oh, this is the way my brain understands it. Like a common example would be like eyeballs or hands to look. So then you just keep redrawing that same symbol over and over again, rather than an actual three-dimensional form. Um, and the key to, the key to overcoming that, at least for me and in my experience, is to use reference. Um, and if you look back through history, you know, all the old masters did it too. They worked for models or uh, photographs once the camera was invented. But, if, you know, I'm looking, these rocks and rubble forms that are in the foreground are directly pulled from the reference I made. Um and I got to tell you, smashing up that plaster was so much fun. Uh, <laughs> I mixed up two like baking sheets full of it. And me and my girlfriend just went at it with a hammer and there were pieces flying everywhere. It was super messy. So uh, I would not recommend doing that in an, in an area that you want to keep clean because <laughs> uh, you're going to find little particles all over the place if you're, if you're doing it right. Um, but that reference was, was invaluable because I was able to get this kind of godlike god ray effect that i wanted you know where there's like a holy kind of beam of light coming down just right over the figures and i was able to actually recreate that with my my models um and my reference to to better inform this painting and you know i just think in terms of painting philosophy just keep harping on this for a little bit um by the time i'm actually painting you know at this point I'd like, I like the battle to be kind of half one, you know, like there's so much of the painting process for my, for my work. That is kind of the pregame, you know, prep work, laying a, a solid foundation. By the time I'm actually putting paint on canvas, I don't really want to be trying to come up with things anymore. I'm not trying to figure out what stuff should be. Usually sometimes that's not the case. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in this painting later on, but generally I want to know what is going down on the canvas by the time I'm actually putting paint on canvas. Uh, right now, this is one of my favorite things to do is adding rim lighting. Rim lighting is a really great way to like instantly add uh, punch to your piece. 
Uh, but you have to do it in moderation. But basically, you know, that's where you can just barely see a little bit of the form is catching light, and it usually comes across as a really strong highlight. And uh, it really helps separate edges. You know, if you've got two things that are of similar value close together, you just add that little highlight, and they're instantly separated, and it looks really good. Um, generally, it does. Uh, but I'm still being informed by reference when you're doing that. You know, uh, if you just punch rim lights in all over the place, similar to the uh, what I was saying before about having too much detail all throughout, if you have rim lights everywhere, it's actually going to cause the image to flatten out because it's going to look like everything. Uh, you're seeing the edges of everything highlighted. So if one or two key areas with rim lighting in it, you're really going to punch up your painting, generally speaking. You can see I just added a little bit of one to the dude's shoulder there. There's one on the rock in front of him. And I wouldn't necessarily call it rim lighting, but that kind of bright pile of rocks down in the bottom center of the piece kind of counts as that too. Um, and it's really fun to look at. You know, your eye kind of bounces across from like, ooh, light, dark rocks, light, dark rocks, back and forth. And it's kind of rhythmic, you know. And you can see I'm putting a rim light in there on the... Uh, the legs of the woman as well. Uh, big thank you to my girlfriend for posing for this one, both as the uh, the figure there and the uh, the giant in the background. <laughs> you know, I've had people before ask me, you know, where do you find models and uh, just people people in your life, my life, uh, your life. If you're trying to find models, you know, it could be a loved one or a lot of my friends have posed, you know, I went to art school, so I was just constantly walking around the studios like, Hey, you want to model for a painting? And more often than not, people would say yes. Um, there's also like professional websites and stuff, but I haven't actually ever hired anybody through a service like that. It's always, uh, either somebody I know directly or a friend of a friend. So, uh, right now I'm painting the, the face. And again, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier about the first pass, second pass thing. All this is still first pass. Um, now, ultimately, the rocks and the rubble, uh, I didn't really change much in the second pass. Um, sometimes I get lucky, and the first pass is, is good enough. And it's awesome when that happens, but I never expect it. You know, it's always a, a happy accident. But uh, painting this face, though, was weird because the light is directly behind the figure. And actually, in the studio, it was just a spotlight. So it was all silhouetted out except for the the hair where the light was able to pass through and it kind of felt weird painting that because it was like this dark brown just blob for a face um but you know ultimately i think it worked out it just felt a little weird to actually to paint it that way but uh you know like some of my favorite instructors have said if if it looks good it is good <laughs> you know so if something feels weird if it ends up looking good that's all that really matters uh kind of the same with music too you know like I think learning uh, music theory and art theory for that matter is really important. You know, you want to have as many tools in your toolbox as possible. But having said that, you know, if you do a weird thing and it ends up working out, you know, just because it might be technically wrong, you know, if it elevates the piece or elevates the music or, or whatever, you know, like sometimes that's just what you got to do. Um, but yeah, still painting the figure here, going in with some really tiny brushes. You can see I have a piece of wood there. Um, there's this device that a lot of uh, 18th century or 19th century artists would use called a mall stick. And the traditional version is it's uh, probably like a foot or two foot long stick with a wad of cotton or like a cloth on the end. And you actually put that on the canvas and rest your hand on the stick. Um, I don't have one of those. I just have a off cut of a really long stick. And I just hold that with my left hand and then lean against it with my right. And that seems to work pretty well. Um, because, you know, it's really hard to keep your hand steady uh, without bracing it against something, especially when you're working on really fine details. So don't think of it as, like, cheating or anything like that. You know, I've seen a lot of artists that I really look up to, Donato Gincola, a phone, phone shot there, got to document the process. But uh, a lot of artists that I, I look up to, Donato Gincola, Greg Manchess, and, and others uh, I've seen using sticks. You know, whatever helps you get the job done is what you need to do. So whether that's reference again or uh, you see me using the mirror there, um, this is another awesome trick. You know, if you've worked digitally, you can just click to um, flip the canvas horizontally. And if you've been working on a painting for a long time, you know, you kind of get used to the way it looks and things start to 
you might be making mistakes and not be able to see them just because you're used to looking at the painting. Uh, pardon me. But um, if you're working digitally, you can flip the canvas and then you see all these mistakes fresh. It's like you're looking at a new painting. Well, in real life, you can't do that, obviously, but you do have the advantage of mirrors. So I just have this small mirror by my uh, easel at all times. And if I think I need to, I might be going off course or if I just want to check myself, I'll hold the mirror up and it, it really does look like you're looking at someone else's painting. Um, now, having said that, if you do the mirror trick a lot, especially in a short time span, you can actually get used to that too. So, um, in that case, you know, sometimes you just got to step away from a painting for a little while, you know, whether that's finishing that session, coming back the next day fresh or, or working on something else for a few hours or whatever. Um, and you can see it just skipped ahead a, a little bit there. Um, the camera I'm using it lets me record for about 20 minutes and then it, it stops and I have to go back and manually restart it. And sometimes I, I forget to do that. Uh, so sorry, my apologies for that, but, um, Let's talk about what's happening right now. I'm using a ruler. Um, perspective is really important in order to create a convincing three-dimensional uh, illusion. And what I will do is in Photoshop, I'll create a pretty detailed um, perspective diagram where I have you know vanishing points going off uh, wherever they need to go. And then again, I will transfer that to the painting and I'll use a ruler if need be. Um, you know, it's really hard to make a long straight line freehand. And with something architectural like a building or, you know, if you're just trying to do a geometric piece that's got a lot of, you know, right angles and shapes or, or what have you, um, trying to freehand that is really difficult. So if you wanted to, to up that realism, I, you know, use a ruler, absolutely. And I'm just putting it directly on the canvas and I'm, you know, I'm not pushing super hard, just enough to make sure that it won't slide. Um, and then tr I'm tracing that line with my uh, my paintbrush. But uh, I'm not just making the perspective perspective up as I go. I, I created, again, that initial sketch with perspective in it. And then when I made the model, the maquette with rubble and stuff, that uh, also had perspective in it. Um, the big building that I'm painting right now, is actually a big cardboard box and I've drawn a perspective grid on it so I can actually see the way it's receding in space. And that's super helpful for my work. Uh, and if you want to see an example of that, um, I post all my reference to my Patreon page. So anytime I work on a painting and I have a photo shoots or anything of that nature, I post it to Patreon. So you can, you can see, uh, everything that I'm working from there and, and see the exact stuff I did. Yep. Another, uh, another phone shot. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, doing some d damage to the building now. I was really inspired, am continually inspired by the work of Jeremy Geddes. That's uh, Jeremy Geddes, G-E-D-D-E-S. He does these awesome cityscape and urban landscape paintings of buildings being ripped apart. And uh, I'm nowhere near his level yet, but uh, super inspiring to look at that stuff. It gives me ideas for how to crush my own buildings. It's funny, you know, like for a long time, buildings... Uh, really scared me to paint, you know, there, um, I felt like I had to design one each time and it's really not the case, you know, like I took a walk with my girlfriend downtown, uh, semi recently and just took hundreds and hundreds of photos of buildings there. So I've got like this huge Rolodex of buildings and I just go through those and I'm like, Ooh, that's a really cool one. And I'll work from that or just Google images too is really good for that. Um, and I will combine photos of buildings I see online with the reference that I've already taken in order to put it in the proper angle or the proper uh, view. Um, also, uh, Google Street View is awesome. Like, you know, going online and zooming around Tokyo or some foreign country and being able to, to see what their buildings look like is super, super uh, fun and useful for my process. Um painting in some windows right now. So when I was starting to paint these, I knew fairly quickly after I started them that I had made the windows too bright. You know, I was talking earlier about that kind of dust and debris pushing things back in space and really for how far away the building is from the viewer, there should be a lot more dust and stuff in front of that kind of obscuring it and causing the values to flatten out or gray out. 
Um, but I just chose to keep going with it like this. And the reason for that is, um, well, most of my painting process is direct painting. And what that means is I just uh, paint wet into wet, let it dry. And if I need to make corrections, I'll paint wet into wet again on top of it with a new layer and, and adjust as needed. Um, glazing is a really cool way to adjust what's already there without having to do a significant amount of repainting. So in this case, I was like, okay, so the building's a bit too contrasty and I need to gray it out a little bit. I'll just finish painting what I'm painting now, let it dry fully, and then I'll come back with some of that sky color and using a mixture of linseed oil, linseed stand oil, and um, chirpanoid or odor odorless mineral, mineral spirits, pardon my pronunciation. Um, using that mix, I'll water down the paint. Pardon me. And not so watery that I can actually see individual paint particles, but mm, pretty liquidy, so it kind of runs. I'll smear that over the surface and then blot it off with a brush. And that I find that generally that leaves just enough paint um, to create kind of a foggy effect. Um, and that's what I need in this case. But there's other ways to glaze too where um, you don't do any wiping or you actually paint back into the glaze and it kind of becomes a hybrid glaze slash wet into wet technique. Um, but I found for like fog or smoke clouds and stuff, uh, putting on a glaze and then wiping it off seems to work really well. And right now you can see I'm actually starting the second pass uh, with the hand. And, uh, ooh, signature time too. <laughs> it's kind of funny, you know, like I think a lot of people imagine that a signature is this quick thing that an artist just dashes off. You know, they're like, ooh, psh, 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 sign my painting. Uh, but not for me. And uh, I remember when I was at the Illustration Masterclass in 2017, I saw Greg Manchester sign a painting. And it took him, I think, like five attempts where he did it really carefully and it was like, oh, no, it's not good enough. Wiped it off and did it again. And I'm kind of the same way. I uh, take my time with it and you can actually see that I, I wiped out a little bit of a letter and, and it, I'm taking a second crack at it. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, I want it to be really precise, similar to that old master kind of look. And that just means uh, it takes a minute and you have to be careful with it and, and slow and steady. So I didn't get a chance to record the glazing process on this one. Um, as I said earlier, the camera only records for so long and then it, it shuts off. So I just missed it, unfortunately. Um, next time I do that technique, I'll definitely uh, try to record it for you guys and gals. But yeah, so here's the final, the finished piece. The uh, only thing I did after this, after I finished painting it, was I usually let it dry for a week or so. Uh, longer if I used a lot of white or uh, really thick paint that takes longer to be surface dry. And the varnish I use is called uh, Gamvar by Gamblin. And the awesome thing about Gamvar is that unlike traditional varnishes like Damar, um, you can put it on as soon as the painting is touch dry. And because it is only a semi, it's like a semi permeable varnish that lets it continue to dry. Um, Cause normally if you wanted to put on like a Damar varnish or something, you need to wait for six months to a year for the painting to fully cure. Um, otherwise, what can happen is, you know, the paint keeps drying underneath the varnish and causes it to crack or wrinkle. Um, but Gamvar lets you put it on early, much earlier, you can after like a week or two, and then the painting continues to dry. And this is great when you've got like uh, shows coming up or you're trying to run an art business like me or, or whatever, you know, you need to be able to produce work relatively quickly so gamvar really uh really helps facilitate that um but yeah let me know in the comments what you think of this piece um and if you want to see the varnishing videos those are actually up on my instagram too so you can go check those out uh but yeah this is this piece and um if you'd like to see it in person i'm going to be at a LuxCon this year in october I'm in the showcase, which is on October 25th and the 26th. So if you're in the um, Reading, Pennsylvania area, come on down and see me. I'd love to meet you and talk about art and giants and kaiju and stuff. Uh, if not, then uh, yeah, just check back soon because I'm painting all the time. I'll have some more, more content up for you soon. And thank you so much for watching. Have a fantastic day. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs>